Hello, and welcome uh, to the Stanford Precision Health for Ethnic and Racial Equity, Transdisciplinary Collaborative Center's Precision Health Equity in Primary Care Seminar Series. We are excited to launch our four session series today with a seminar on the topic of precision health and social justice. The goals of today's seminar, next slide please. are to identify major health inequities that could be addressed by precision health strategies, to understand research disparities in precision medicine, and to share innovative approaches to closing evidence and care gaps to promote social justice. Uh, my name is Sean David, and I am a family physician and a co-investigator with the SPHERE Implementation Corps, and I serve as the Program Director for Translational Science with the Outcomes Research Network and Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Family Medicine at North Shore University Health System, and I'm the clinical professor of family medicine at the University of Chicago. And I'm joined by Dr. Lisa Goldman Roses, who is the lead for the implementation core for SPHERE, and she's an assistant professor of, in the departments of epidemiology and population health, as well as medicine at, at Stanford, and is faculty director for the Office of Community Engagement at Stanford Cancer. This seminar is accredited by the American Medical Association for 1.5 hours of CME credit, so make sure uh, physicians that you're able to, to claim that credit and other providers. Very good. Um, today's agenda is as follows. Um, Dr. Bonnie Maldonado is the principal investigator for Sphere, and she will be introducing our first keynote speaker. And we are very honored today to have Dr. Eliseo Peristobal, who is director of the NIH National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Following Dr. Peristobal's lecture, we will have five minutes for questions taken from the participants. So please use the Q&A uh, button to enter your questions at any time during the lecture. And we will uh, feed those to Dr. Peristobal at the end of his, uh, some, his presentation. Uh, and next, we will be are privileged to be joined by Dr. Dorian Miller, uh, and who will be presenting on, on her work uh, related to the MHD funded U54 program and social justice around precision health in Chicago. And following Dr. Miller's presentation, we will be joined by an expert panel, including Dr. Miller and Dr. Mildred Cho from Stanford and Isabel Duran from the Latino Cancer Institute. Uh, the agenda uh, is as follows, and we'll try to keep on time, but we have an hour and a half, and we hope to have a really rich discussion. Next slide, please. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, uh, who is the principal investigator for SPEAR. Dr. Maldonado is a senior associate dean for faculty development and diversity and the Taub Endowed Professor of Global Health and Infectious Diseases. And she's a professor of epidemiology and population health and chief of the division of pediatric infectious diseases at Stanford. She's also medical director of infection prevention and control. And she's an attending physician at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. In addition to her many national and international leadership and research activities, she has led a number of NIH, CDC, USAID, Gates Foundation, and WHO funded domestic international vaccine studies, as well as research into the prevention and treatment of HIV infection in the US, India, Mexico, and Africa. So thank you, Dr. Maldonado. And I uh, am delighted to uh, pass this on to you to introduce Dr. Peristobal. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here today. Uh, we are extremely proud of our SPHERE uh, collaborative work, and it's been very successful. We've been able to work um, pivot uh, somewhat in the last year and work on uh, COVID issues around underrepresented and vulnerable populations. And so uh, this has been a really remarkable opportunity for us to uh, embark on this journey of addressing health disparities, especially with a focus on precision health. So today I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker who is Dr. Uh, Eliseo Perez Stable. Um, he's the director of the Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Um, and that uh, NIMHD seeks to advance the science of minority health and health disparities research through research training, research capacity development, public information and information dissemination. Dr. Bettis established uh, practice general internal medicine for 37 years at the University of California, San Francisco, just right up the road from where I live, uh, before moving uh, to the National Institutes of Health in September 2015. 
He was professor of medicine at UCSF and chief of the division of general internal medicine for 17 years. His research interests include improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved populations, advancing patient-centered care, improving cultural, uh, cross-cultural communication skills among clinicians, and promoting diversity in the biomedical research workforce. For more than 30 years, um, he has led research on Latino smoking cessation and tobacco control policy in the United States and Latin America, addressing clinical and prevention issues in cancer screening and mentoring over 70 minority investigators. So truly a, a blazing a trail in this area that has become very focused of, as of late, but clearly has been doing this for most of his career. And so we're uh, very excited to have him here. Um, and we um, will we'll hand it off to you, uh, Dr. Beresal Stablin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Th thanks for that kind introduction, and uh, uh, thank you, Sean and Bonnie, for doing this. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here among friends, uh, both uh, old friends and new friends, uh, and grantees from NIMHD. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and give you a, a brief uh, summary of uh, the issues that we are going to discuss about. I was asked to speak no more than 15 minutes. So I'm going to try to go through very high level uh, perspectives on this topic and hopefully more issues will come out in the conversation and make sure I can see my own slides. Um, so well, let's see advance so I I'll start with our definition who we call populations with health disparities. The first three bullets listed on this slide were uh, part of our original legislation in the year 2000. So all racial and ethnic minorities as defined by the census. So that could change if that changes. Uh, all poor people of any color. Um, and uh, this is important to emphasize. Uh, underserved rural residents. I qualify this by saying underserved. That was in our legislation. And I think there are some specific issues relevant there. And in 2016, we uh, declared sexual and gender minorities as a population with health disparities for NIH research purposes after a several year process led by uh, NIH leadership uh, at, uh, well, Dr. Tabak, who is still the principal deputy. So a health outcome that is worse in one of these groups in comparison to a reference group uh, defines a health disparity. So point here is not all differences are disparities and that not uh, everything uh, related to health outcomes for these populations is worse. Uh, so keep that in mind as you, as you traverse these, these, uh, this literature. We also embraced a unifying factor of a social disadvantage among all these populations that result from being subject to discrimination or racism and being underserved in healthcare. Uh, uh, we believe this was a critical point in uh, declaring sexual and gender minorities a uh, population with health disparities. Uh, at NIMHD, we consider race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status as two, if you wish, uh, demographic factors or individual social determinants of health uh, that are fundamental uh, in all health research and in all health care, so both for clinical and research purposes. This may seem obvious to many of you, but uh, it is not uh, to many uh, who have been doing clinical research or who are definitely who are not working with human beings. So race or ethnicity and socioeconomic status predict life expectancy and mortality that are really not fully explained. African-Americans, for example, have more strokes when compared to whites for the same level of systolic blood pressure, same exact uh, level, same age group, uh, same adjusting for other factors, more strokes, and by a factor of two. Most chronic diseases are more common in people who are poor of any race, ethnicity, and um, that is not due to bad behavior. Uh, so uh, put that in context. And finally, a, a point about persons with type 2 diabetes of any racial ethnic minority, which are more common to have diabetes by at least a twofold factor, uh, all have less heart disease and more end-stage renal disease when compared to their white counterparts in a 10-year follow-up study from Kaiser, Northern California. This is the life expectancy in the U.S., the last available data from CDC. You can see uh, the white-black gap that is there, three years and uh, almost uh, four and a half years for men, 
This may actually worsen by a couple of years because of COVID, although those are preliminary estimates uh, published recently. And that Latinos, the only other racial ethnic group for which we have national estimates, actually do better than whites by a significant amount, uh, almost three years for men and three years for women. Uh, this is not fully understood. Everyone believes it's due to the immigrant paradox and will go away. But keep in mind that 70% of US Latinos today were born in the United States. Social class, however, is a potent predictor of many health outcomes, including uh, mortality. And these are data uh, that uh, Raj Chetty, when he was at Stanford, uh, used to uh, look at inequality, income inequality leading to increased mortality. And what you can see here is a household income of four, a household of four, I'm sorry, has an average income of $25,000, which is about the poverty level, is three times more likely that person to die from anything compared to someone with a household income of 115,000, which we know is well off, but not wealthy. And to put this in context, median income in the US is about $62,000, uh, again, pre-COVID. Um, and how often do researchers, clinical researchers, or how often do clinicians really know uh, the social class of their patients? Uh, I, I think that uh, a, a reflection on that would point that most of the time we, we don't really inquire on either end or in the middle. Uh, so how would you do this? So the easiest way that researchers have found uh, very predictable and simple is to ask about formal years of education. It's limited, you don't get quality. There's other factors that go into this, but clearly it is a very robust predictor uh, of many uh, outcomes and behaviors and does not lose uh, its power in the, with the lifespan. So older adults who would still hold income is also great, although more people are sensitive to talking about money uh, on both ends of the spectrum. You have to then adjust it also for household and number of dependents. Uh, again, um, uh, a, a little bit more invasive as perceived by most individuals, but easily easy enough to obtain. Occupation is what was used in the classic uh, you, uh, study in the, in the United Kingdom, the Whitehall study, that uh, Michael Marmot uh, was one of the uh, authors. Um, where you look at labor, you know, uh, service, technical, professional, business, you have to classify into these different categories. There's also a concept of occupational prestige or control of what you do, uh, which have been used as metrics for uh, looking at health. Uh, life course, socioeconomic status is very important. So it's very different. I, I use the, the example of, let's say, two cardiologists that you talk to, similar education, similar income. Uh, one is the first one in uh, her family to have gone to college. Uh, the other one is a third generation San Francisco homeowner. And we know what that means. So you've built up equity and wealth as property prices doubled every decade uh, for a while. Uh, uh, pediatricians use parental education and ultimately you can impute data from census tracts uh, and not even ask any questions and this is pretty good not, not i don't like it as much as primary data but it's certainly pretty good has been validated and i'm trying to see whether we can start doing this uh, or ask investigators to report this uh, for all the participants they recruit into their clinical studies in the last three years, NMHC has really uh, emphasized the use of common data elements. Uh, our, our niche is on the social determinants of health, but it includes all these demographic factors as well as other individual, as well as structural social determinants. This is on a website called the Phoenix Toolkit. You can uh, see the measures that we've vetted, uh, either because they've been used for a long time in national surveys, or we went through a process of a external uh, scientific panel that reviewed and vetted these. Uh, we are initiating a second round of this for the many measures for which we have not uh, come to a conclusion or agreement on, on this. And uh, we're trying to encourage our investigators to use the common data elements, to use the same measures. Uh, believe me, it's a socialization that researchers are not used to, and uh, we're still working very hard on, on doing this. Um, this is our research framework, and I mentioned this in this, sorry, in this group to emphasize the importance of the patient-clinician relationship, the healthcare system, 
We know about some of these factors that are individually related, as well as availability of services and quality of care. It's not the same uh, to practice at uh, Stanford Medical or UCSF uh, Healthcare uh, than to work in a community clinic uh, where there is only primary care. And to get a specialty consult, often you need to depend on what uh, people here call quote unquote charity care uh, because the, pa the patient is uninsured. Uh, and so I uh, do understand that this, uh, this spectrum is really quite complex. Let me mention or pivot to the topic of racism. Uh, this has become, uh, like COVID, uh, very much uh, in our sites at NIH in the last year. Uh, this is data from the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, from, several, from six years ago, uh, showing that asking the simple question that the past 30 days were you treated unfairly because of racial or ethnic background in a variety of settings, as you can see here. And it's astounding to me that 53% of African-Americans say yes, that in the past 30 days, not lifetime, not year, 30 days, they had been treated unfairly. Latinos is 36% uh, still substantially higher than for whites. And although we do a lot better in healthcare, the main issue is that these experiences are being lived by our patients and our participants. Uh, this level of interpersonal racism, which is what that item captures, uh, is where most of the research has been done the last 20, 25 years. Uh, outstanding work has been done by a number of scientists. There are good scales, including on our Phoenix uh, website, uh, the Everyday Discrimination Scale. It's not the only one. Uh, and, uh, and so I would encourage you to refer to that as a context that does predict outcomes such as behaviors, uh, mental health issues, uh, cardiovascular reactivity, and other um, uh, specific health outcomes. What has not been studied at all uh, in a health context, or nearly at all, is structural racism and discrimination. Uh, this relates to the history, culture of institutions, policies that codified practices that have perpetuated inequity based on an ideology of inferiority of one group compared to another. And we have now uh, concluded this is an imperative to research, not only research the associations, but also uh, interventions to reduce this. And we have a request for applications from the NIH, broadly supported by many institutes uh, and centers uh, to uh, fund projects in this area. And NIH is actively working on a larger common fund program for fiscal year 2023. Um, Diversity in science and medicine is really a demographic mandate. Uh, there are data from the medical expenditure panel survey that say that un underrepresented minority clinicians take care of about 50% or more of underrepresented minority patients. It's not coincidence. Um, I think that the same kind of factors play a role in biomedical scientific workforce. Uh, the pipeline is not empty. Uh, there are about 14, 15% of medical school graduates and 15% of new PhDs in uh, the U.S. are from underrepresented groups. Uh, they're not being hired, uh, not in sufficient numbers uh, to make a change. So everybody always wants to go to the high school students or the undergraduate students. I say the challenge is the people who have made it through that uh, pipeline and are now looking for opportunity. This is the time to engage them. There is good evidence about more healthcare, better uh, engagement of uh, underrepresented groups. In research, we don't have as much data on this, but clearly it seems to be a pattern. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to think of diversity not as a, everyone's different, we need to have all views represented and all perspectives, which may be all good, but it really is about inclusion of people from all backgrounds, especially those who have been viewed different because of exclusionary practices. Sociologists refer to this as a critical diversity. Uh, Patient-clinician communication is a powerful tool that we have not, I think, leveraged sufficiently, emphasized sufficiently, or researched sufficiently. It's felt to be soft, you know, how do you quantify it? There's been outstanding work done in this area by many researchers, although less so from an equity lens and less so linking it to outcomes. Um, there's data that uh, elegant studies done by Lisa Cooper uh, now 20 years ago, showing that race ethnic concordance, race concordance and visits were longer, 
had higher patient positive effect, better satisfaction for the patients, and the, and the clinicians were rated as being more engaged in medical decisions, so more, uh, more open for that. And in a Commonwealth survey from, again, 20 years ago, uh, asking the question about whether patients had trouble understanding their doctor, physician didn't listen, or had questions they could not ask. All of you who practice medicine know these things happen. White said 16% yes to any of those for Blacks, for Latinos, and for Asians. The responses of yes on one or more was higher. This is not coincidence. Um, lots of questions often come up about cross-cultural issues. Um, and this is mostly acknowledging this. Uh, there are many different styles of communication, verbal, nonverbal, whether how much eye contact people have. This has been, I think, uh, exacerbated by the electronic health record. Uh, whether it's okay to touch, of course, that was pre-COVID. Now everybody will be phobic about that, understandably so. How much personal space do you, do you need? How formal do you, are you? Uh, how much informality does one tolerate? Some of this is driven by culture. Uh, the trust is, issue is a big one. Uh, African Americans and other uh, groups that have been historically um, uh, the, sort of discriminated against uh, have mistrust in systems. Uh, but I believe that most individual clinicians can overcome this uh, with the right approach, uh, with the empathetic, empathic approach uh, and respectful approach to patient care and research. Um, often decision making and family dynamics are not driven by individual autonomy, as is the mantra in the United States, and I think this is important to acknowledge. Uh, there are models of illness that differ, there's perception, there's stigma that differs, traditions and customs and spirituality that affects us. And if you want to know two topics that always bring up conflict in whatever culture you're dealing with, potential conflict, I should say, or controversy, it's anything having to do with sex and gender and anything having to do with end of life care. Uh, I recently read a physician uh, essay in one of the, in the Washington Post about empathy in care. I think this was written by a neurosurgeon uh, and uh, how we really uh, need to leverage that as a tool, as a therapeutic tool. Uh, it also helps us uh, deal with the challenges of taking care of people who are very sick. So let me finish with my two bits of advice about precision medicine and clinical care. I think the field is uh, far from uh, having prime time, uh, and uh, this is independent of what Dr. Collins thinks. Uh, I think that what is more precise, individualized approach, better than a standard one, needs to be demonstrated uh, as being, you know, ha having efficacy, uh, especially when standard approaches have worked. And I say one size fits all can work to improve outcomes in many clinical situations. And of course, one size fits all is a stereotype. It's not, you never do everything the same, uh, whether you look at uh, treatment of hypertension or other such things where we have had success. Remember that new is not always better and it's almost always more expensive. Uh, healthcare is maybe the only quote unquote industry where technology advances have increased costs as opposed to decrease. And uh, this is something that we, uh, it's a structural problem of the way we, uh, organized healthcare and the way reimbursement is done and healthcare insurance is, is done. So costs, costs must be considered. Uh, there's a power in precision patient-clinician interactions, and I would emphasize that uh, in the context of enhancing cultural competence, cultural humility, and uh, acknowledging and reducing issues around discrimination. So I, I'll stop with that and uh, turn it back to you, Sean. Let me stop sharing. There we go, and we're on, so. Well, thank you very much for a really brilliant presentation. And uh, we, I, I have a question for you about, you know, we've learned a lot about issues with respect to uh, trust in the healthcare system and genetics research from our own work with Sphere. And a lot of the same issues that are similar to vaccine hesitancy and so forth, but it really comes down to this institutional trust issue. And so going the next step, do you have any thoughts about how working with NIH, we could begin to study more culturally aware approaches to this that also get the molecular genetics right and relevant to everybody? Because there seem to be a lot of challenges that we've learned. And um, 
as a primary care physician, I'm eager to have better tools and better approaches. Well, I think with I think a lot of work needs to be done. I I would say that in the in the realm of um, uh, cancer therapeutics, uh, precision uh, health, precision care related to genetic, uh, the genotyping, uh, particularly the uh, somatic mutations of tumors, is here. I mean, that's a reality today, and and that's one area that you know access to that and approaches to that need to be addressed systematically. Um, it often is uh, not accessible to systems that are poor. Uh, and so, you know, insurance coverage or, uh, or systems don't have the, you know, don't have availability. I mean, if you work in a community clinic um, in a primary care setting uh, in DC, uh, you have to have some arrangements with either some charity care or send them to NIH if they fit a protocol and then they'll get all the stuff that, that one would get. And, and, you know, that's an unequal um, uh, way of caring for patients, which I think is, you know, inherently, uh, you know, uh, it's a, pro I have a problem with it. Uh, it's not just social justice. I think there are ethical issues around that, but I would say that for most other conditions, uh, we're not yet able to leverage the use of, I've got the full genotype here, you know, it's all relative uh, risks and it's relative risks that are uh, hard for uh, even clinicians to fully understand, much less patients. Uh, if I tell a patient, oh, you have a low risk or a high risk of something, they think a high risk means like 50-50. Um, they're not thinking 20% uh, chance of having a heart attack in the next 10 years, which is what we call high risk, right? Um, and it's high enough to say, put on a medicine every day. And, and I don't think people get, can get their head around that. Uh, and even, even uh, people with college degrees, they just don't, they, you know, they'll, they'll have to trust that we're the, translating this, the information for them. So um, I, I think we're, we've got to continue to do lots of uh, discovery science in, you know, what are the best approaches, you know, what's available, how do we do it, what, in what context, before I would say we're ready for generalizing it. That's my, my two cents. Yeah, yeah. There, there are lots of research opportunities across the NIH, so I, I won't bore you with that. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a question from a participant. It has to do with how people are classified in terms of ethnic racial categories. And the comment was, does the Ikatino um, community include those who are also considered, consider themselves as white because there's a difference between the basically white people that have some Latino tie Many generations ago, and did not have cultural ties. Right. Latinos the experience more cult more culturally. Is there a way to distinguish? Well, uh, the, I should have said this. Uh, we, so we uh, consider that race ethnicity is a self-identified social construct. Period. It has lots of other components to it, including biological ones. Which now there's a real pushback to even acknowledging that. So I think that's important to to get out there. Um, Latinos or Latinas, uh, Hispanics, represent sort of a 500 years of admixture, mixture in Latin America. Yes, the European colonialists came first and Spanish and multiple other European so sources, including the same ones that came to the United States. Um, and the indigenous people in Latin America were mixed and were not, were too numerous to, to have uh, obliterated through uh, uh, genocidal tactics, not that the Spanish didn't try. And of course, there were uh, 6 million Africans uh, who were brought to the Americas uh, as slaves and 4 million actually went to the Caribbean or, or South America. So that, that mixture is fairly unique in, on, in global human, human history. Uh, I think South Asia is like that, India, although much less studied than Latin America in that regard. And Hawaii is a more modern one where you see these different lines come to uh, a defined geographic area and mix uh, in a way that allows for some interesting observation of what that brings uh, to the table. So yes, the, the census did try for 2020 to say, eliminate the two-part question and just say, how do you identify yourself and offer Latino Hispanic as one of the options. Uh, they also wanted to create a new ethnic group called MENA, the Middle Eastern North African. 
And if I had my, if I could advise them, I would say create one of the South Asians because they're very different than East Asians. But that did not happen. It did not get approved by the administration. Uh, and so we will wait, have to wait for another revision. Um, the 2020 census did ask everyone about their national background. So whites and African-Americans for the first time ever were asked about their family background or national background uh, country-wise, uh, which of course uh, people from who are Latino, Hispanic or Asian or Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian have been asked for, uh, for several census now and American Indians, Alaska Natives identify a tribe tribal affiliation if they have one, so. Okay, well, thank you. I'm sure there are many more questions, including from the panelists, but um, I'd like to thank you very much and, and introduce our next keynote speaker today. <clears throat> we could advance. Thank you. And so uh, I'd like, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Dorian Miller. Dr. Dorian Miller uh, is a general internist and she has been providing care to underserved minority populations for more than 20 years. She is Associate Professor of Medicine and Director for the Center for Community Health and Vitality, as well as uh, she is now Director for Health Equity Integration for the Institute for Translational Medicine at the University of Chicago Medicine. Uh, she also has a special interest in behavioral health and under her leadership, Physicians, educators, and community mem work members work to improve population health outcomes for residents in the south side of Chicago through community-engaged research, demonstration, and service models. Uh, she has uh, led in many different programs throughout uh, Chicagoland and nationally, uh, and she's done a lot of work in the area of asthma outcomes through school and community interventions. And was noted by the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology with a 2006 Special Recognition Award Prior to, to joining the University of Chicago, uh, she served as a national program director of New Health Partnerships, a demonstration project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the California Healthcare Foundation and collaborative self-management support. Uh, so it, it's my privilege to uh, welcome my colleague and friend, Dr. Dorian Miller. Great, thank you so much, Dr. David. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm gonna bring up my screen and share my slide set and um, we can go ahead and get started. Great, thank you. Um, so I was asked to speak today on the challenges of advancing health equity through precision medicine and to look at this through the lens of social justice. Um, it was wonderful hearing Dr. Perez Stavli um, talk about some of the issues around um, cultural awareness, issues around um, disparities, et cetera, and really the framing for what we need to do as, a pri as primary care providers. And so, although I've done work in the area around improving chronic disease outcomes in various ways, I still think of myself as a primary care provider who's spent now at this point um, more than 30 years providing care to um, under-resourced communities. Um, and so as I think about this topic and also the, the work that's taking place, I think back to 1994, 1995, when I was working at a community health center in the Bay Area and started hearing a little bit about the burgeoning information that was coming out of the Human Genome Project and specifically information about BRCA1 and BRCA2 being discovered in 1994 and 1995 respectively and thought about this within the context of, I'm sitting here in a safety net setting and I'm caring for a patient population that for the vast majority of my patients lacked health insurance at the time, um, only about 15 to 20% had even public health insurance in terms of having Medicaid. And I kept on wondering, what does this mean for the patients that I care for? And would they ever be able to take advantage of the burgeoning information that was occurring with the Human Genome Project, but also, and also um, whether or not they would even be able to access it. And so for those reasons, I really appreciate having the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Um, I have no financial uh, uh, relationships to disclose for this particular talk. 
Um, what I'd like to do in the few minutes that we have remaining is to review the importance of precision medicine for promoting health equity, because I do think that there's a role. However, in describing that role, I'll also describe some of the barriers to using precision medicine to improve health equity, and also potential approaches to promoting precision medicine in underrepresented populations. Let's start off with a little bit of level setting um, in terms of how do we see health equity and what's the definition of it. It's the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. This is something that's taken from the Healthy People um, 2020. And the most important pieces of this is that we can do as much as possible to avoid inequalities in terms of the provision of health care. We can address perhaps historical and also contemporary injustices uh, that take place in healthcare and also the elimination of health and healthcare disparities. And so um, the slide that Dr. Prezestabla showed a little while ago about the experience over the past 30 days of what someone who's African-American experiences in terms of um, discrimination, I think certainly rings true in terms of not only the patients that I see, but also in my day-to-day -day experiences as an African-American woman in US society. I also think that in terms of thinking about how do we frame this as primary care providers, that we need to think about how can we deliver the highest quality of care possible. And so I'll go back to some of the tenets that were uh, discussed in the seminal publication by the National Academy of Medicine called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And so some of you may remember when this came out right after um, the, uh, uh, the publication around um, errors, um, that there were six tenants that were promoted around being able to provide high quality care. And that is safety, effectiveness using evidence-based practices, patient-centered practices, making sure that care is delivered on a timely basis and is efficient, and also care that's equitable. I put in red on this slide the areas of patient-centeredness, making sure that any care that's delivered to our patients really focuses on the needs values and preferences of our patients, and also making sure that the care is equitable, meaning that there is no variance due to race, ethnicity, geography, gender, or socioeconomic status. Now, I find this definition of equitable care very interesting because that seems to imply that there is equality in terms of being able to provide care. But as you know, depending upon the circumstances that a patient lives in and the intersection of um, other factors within a person's life, whether it be their communities, whether it be personal behavior, whether it be education level, the environment that they live in, there are other factors that come into play in terms of how we are able to deliver efficient and effective care. And I think the example that Dr. Prestopel gave a moment ago of being in a safety net setting and thinking about how these resources are available to patients uh, is, is very telling. Um, but again, there are still opportunities in this space, and in a little while I'll describe to you some of the work that's taken place through a project that I've worked on over the past few years um, that I think has been able to demonstrate. Uh, just a quote from former President Barack Obama about the launch of the White House Precision Medicine Initiative. Doctors have always recognized that every patient is unique, and doctors have always tried to tailor their treatments as best as they can to individuals. We match blood transfusions to a blood type, and that was a very important discovery. But what if matching a cancer cure to our genetic code was just as easy and just as standard? What if figuring out the right dosage of medicine was as simple as taking a temperature? And in that, I think that the promise of precision medicine lays out that framework. The question is, for patients that perhaps um, may have some of the uh, inequities thrust upon them due to race, ethnicity, poverty, social circumstances, geographic disparities that we see in terms of urban versus rural, being able to receive care through an academic health center versus being in the community. All of these things come into play when we think about whether or not we can provide precision medicine in an equitable fashion. Um, a little bit of a screenshot for you regarding some of the ways that the public may be seeing um, uh, issues around precision medicine. In your upper left-hand corner, you'll see um, a screenshot of the All of Us program that uh, many people are familiar with uh, that's sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. 
Um, if you think about the ability to provide precision medicine at an academic health center, the screenshot that's on your upper left, but right hand corner of the screen is from the University of Chicago Medicine and our Center for Personalized Therapeutics. And so again, we're a tertiary uh, academic health center. People come to us um, for their care. Um, and that we have these incredible resources, not just in terms of the delivery of clinical care, but also in the terms of being able to bring into play our research capabilities in order to um, provide people with personalized therapeutics. Down in the lower left-hand side of your screen is actually a screenshot from the project that I've been working on over the past few years called ACCOUNT, or the African American uh, Cardiovascular Pharmacogenomics Consortium. Um, it's a program that's actually uh, funded by um, the National Institutes of Health through uh, NIMHD. And it's a program that has been designed to look at not just the basic science and also translation into practice around cardiovascular pharmacogenomics, but also how does this impact community um, and how can we bring both frontline clinicians as well as patients into the fold to learn more about it. And then finally, the screenshot that you see at the bottom there is from the uh, uh, advertisement that I was able to pick up as a screenshot offline, but you may have seen advertisements like this on television in that um, oftentimes people are hit with direct to consumer advertising that is in the area of precision medicine. And so for someone who has this particular mutation, um, they may be responsive to this medication and the patient may come to see me as a primary care provider to say, you know, I've just been diagnosed with X and I'm seeing a doctor in oncology and I see this thing on TV. Is this something that I can have access to? Is this something that is some that will help to improve my particular state. And so it's not just a question about people learning about these things through their physicians, but there's also direct to consumer advertising, specifically in the area of precision medicine. And so um, again, people are learning about this in the general public and the question of how they can access it and whether or not there are disparities that exist in being able to access precision medicine, I think uh, are, continue to exist. So let's talk a little bit about barriers in precision medicine and health equity um, under the following categories, uh, discrimination and bias in human rights, um, whether or not there's equitable participation in research and what barriers exist there, and whether or not even for particularly for racial and ethnic minorities, is there an interest in participation? And then finally, what are some of the barriers in healthcare delivery and how can we address some of these things in day-to-day -day practice? So the issue of discrimination, bias, and human rights. Um, oftentimes when patients of mine, and I take care of primarily a minority population of both African-Americans and, and Latinx patients, um, when they think about whether or not they would like to participate in clinical research in precision medicine, some of them will come to me with a bit of hesitancy. And I have had patients, I have had community members that I speak to on this topic to say, well, what happened with those boys down in Tuskegee? And that's how many of my older patients will refer to them because some of them actually remember and were living in the South when the uh, US Public Health Service Tuskegee syphilis experiment was taking place. Um, they may have had family members and older relatives that have passed on that uh, may have been directly involved, which I've actually found in more than one case um, um, over the years. For my patients that are younger, they sometimes refer to uh, Henrietta Lacks um, after having either read the book or have seen, uh, having seen the HBO documentary on the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks and what that has meant to um, being involved in research. And they have questions about some of the uh, ethical issues that would take that have taken place in the past and what does this mean for their participation in research and being uh, having access to precision medicine in this day and age. Now this bottom uh, 
photo um, doesn't have a caption, but I was able to pull it from um, publicly available information around the uh, Guatemala syphilis experiments, which we were an extension of some of the work that our public health service did in the Tuskegee experiment, in which they went to Guatemala and actually infected prisoners and prostitutes in the country of Guatemala with syphilis, um, and they were denied treatment in order to uh, study the natural course of syphilis in this population. This took place um, in the 1940s. Um, as people learn more and more about these things, they sometimes wonder, well, is this for me? Should I participate? And what are the protections that are going to be involved in making sure that um, my rights are preserved if I participate in any sort of research around precision medicine or even having precision medicine offered to me in a clinical setting. However, in spite of these things, there's actually a fair amount of willingness for patients to share health information to aid researchers. Uh, this is information that's uh, taken from the organization Research in, uh, America that was done in partnership with Zogby Analytics, um, or a survey that was done in May of 2013, that does a breakdown in terms of both race and also uh, a Hispanic ethnicity about someone's willingness to share their personal information um, so that researchers could better understand diseases and develop new ways to prevent, treat, and cure them. And as you can see, although the numbers are lower for African Americans, you can see that almost 75% of African Americans are willing to provide personal health information to researchers in this space. The higher numbers are higher for non-Hispanic whites, Asians, and also Hispanics. But that is with the caveat that appropriate privacy protections are in place. And so we'll come back to that particular point in just a moment as we think about uh, some of the issues around genetic information and what this may mean. In terms of barriers in healthcare delivery, um, uh, uh, Dr. Prestable mentioned in his comments about the issue of patients that are maybe seen in community health centers um, in safety net settings or in rural settings that may be concerned about whether or not if they are enrolled in a study that would give them information around their particular genomic makeup and its impact on a particular condition, are they going to be able to access care after their diagnosis? One of the things that we ran into in the account study um, was the issue of making sure of, of fit, figuring out whether or not there was adequate coverage in insurance packages for patients that were interested in receiving pharmacogenomic testing um, to find out if about whether or not they would have a particular response to any cardiovascular medications. And then finally, and this is the point that I alluded to just a moment ago, the issue of inadequate protection against discrimination, um, which still exists in this space. And so we're gonna talk about some of these things in just a moment. In terms of the promotion of precision medicine for health equity, um, I think that there are opportunities for addressing gaps in the evidence base for um, providing um, precision medicine to diverse populations. And then by doing so, we can reduce the disparities in access to genomic services. And there are opportunities to um, um, and programs that are actually designed to work in this space, but very importantly, making sure that there is an infrastructure built outside of academic medical centers in order to do so. I'm going to address the, uh, go back for just a moment and address the barriers issue around discrimination um, in terms of being able to receive these services, because oftentimes if patients are providing information to um, a healthcare organization around uh, in getting genetic testing, they may be aware of the 2008 Genetic Non-Discrimination Act or the GINA Act, which uh, uh, provides protections for patients around being discriminated against if they happen to have um, genetic testing for a particular condition and it's shown to be positive that their employers cannot discriminate. However, the information is still discoverable for people who are interested in getting life insurance or long-term care insurance or disability insurance by um, outside entities. And so oftentimes that, because of that information, people may be somewhat reluctant or hesitant to provide this information that may be able to provide a, a additional uh, ways to in, 
to impact uh, the gaps in the evidence base that I'll talk about in just a moment. Some of the ways in which we can address the evidence base, particularly by increasing racial and ethnic diversity in genome sequencing, are some of the studies that I mentioned here. Um, the CSER study, which is an acronym for Clinical Sequencing and Evidence Generating Research. This is a study that focuses on children with suspected genetic conditions. Um, the study investigators have committed to dedicating um, more than 60% of the participants recruited in, that are non-European descent and recruitment that's taking place in very diverse settings, um, in, uh, including um, uh, participants that are recruited from places such as UNC Chapel Hill, UCSF, Mount Sinai Montefiore, um, Kaiser, um, the Hudson Alpha Group in rural Alabama, and also through the National he Genomic Research Institute. Uh, the University of Washington is serving as the clinical coordinator for this project. The IGNITE study, Implementing Genomics in Practice, which is focusing in on making sure that genomic information is included in the electronic health record, engaging frontline clinicians in educating their patients about genomics, and also making sure that studies are conducted in diverse settings, such as community hospitals, primary care practices, and also um, veterans administration hospitals who treat underrepresented minorities um, to make sure that there is an expansion of the uh, evidence base for um, genomic sequencing. And finally, the H3 Africa study, which is an internationally funded initiative that's dedicated to facilitating contemporary research around genomics and the environmental determinants of common diseases. This is primarily focusing on the African population and they're empowering African scientists to, to use and to develop this information, not just for communicable, communicable diseases, but also non-communicable diseases on the African continent. A couple of examples of the work that we facilitated through ACCOUNT, the African American Cardiovascular Pharmacogenomics Consortium. Um, in a couple of weeks, for those of you who join us, you'll hear a little bit more about the various uh, pieces of this project from my colleague, Dr. Manoli Ferrara. But I'm going to underscore the work that I've been responsible for through our consortium core, which is the outward facing um, frontline clinician and community engagement piece of this. We've been able to provide some grants um, to uh, investigators in the community that are looking at ways in which they can provide um, both pharmacogenomic testing and also information to uh, populations that otherwise would not be reached. And so an example of one of the uh, grants that was provided was doc to Dr. Elvin Price, who is a geriatric a PhD um, pharmacist who has been working in low income housing in Richmond, Virginia, um, as part of their outreach to the uh, 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 senior citizen population in Richmond and doing cardiovascular pharmacogenomics education and also testing in this population. And then another group also in the South Metland Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, in which they have used their not-for-profit Amity Group Foundation working in conjunction with community health centers caring for uh, low-income African-American communities and educating both the medical professionals that are working in those uh, low-income communities and also their patients on the need for pharmacogenomic te genetic testing um, in those communities. And so just a couple of examples of the work that we have been able to fund through the account project through the consortium core. But as I said, stay tuned for um, a more in-depth con uh, conversation and presentation by my colleague in a couple of weeks. Just a few references for you here at the end um, in terms of the work that I've done. And I think that is the end of my slide set. I'll stop sharing at this point, Dr. David. And I think maybe we've got time for one or two questions before we continue. Thank you so much, um, Dorian, for a really outstanding overview and um, really covering a, a broad swath of, of issues and, and putting this into a clinical framework. It's, it's thank you so much. Uh, we do have one question from a participant. Um, the question is from Elizabeth Ch uh, Liz Chin. Fascinating discussion from both speakers about precision care and trust in the healthcare system. Do you know how having continuous primary care factors into both exacerbating disparities for those who lack continuous care and may provide a mechanism to build trust if there's a greater continuity of care? Um, I think that might be a question for Dr. Perez-Estable and I'll, I'll follow up. 
Well, uh, thank you. I saw that question and, and, and held back. Um, you know, this is a great question, and I don't think we have compelling evidence one way or the other. Um, uh, if you look at, um, at evidence regarding people who have health care coverage, we know that makes a difference in multiple uh, factors, uh, controlled blood pressure, controlled diabetes, and probably mortality, although the data are not all in from the ACA, expand, Medicaid expansion, uh, and it's an ongoing issue. It's all going to be observational uh, over time, but with large numbers, you can make fairly conclusive uh, causal inference. Um, regarding to uh, actually having continuous primary care with the same person, uh, you know, in my gut, I would think, well, that probably helps uh, build uh, trust and, and facilitate communication. I don't know, you know, how much of a difference it makes in outcomes, if the, because I think a lot of the outcomes are determined by the system as well as by the clinician and the patient. So it's complicated. Um, but I think that the point of the question is, is primary care an important a fundamental part of the of promoting health, not just giving good health care. And you know the answer from I, hopefully from this group is a, a, a very resounding yes. Um, I can share that moving from California to the mid-Atlantic, the value and appreciation of primary care in Northern California that I experienced for 37 years is far from present in this area. Uh, and uh, it, it is, uh, you know, I don't know, it's a culture system uh, you know, like that it just is, um, of, if it's concerning, and, but it is a policy system issue that defines it. So. Yeah, also, I just wanted to help respond to this a little bit too. The work of Barbara Starfield shows that in any society, the more primary care there is, the more longer people live, and it's no question that it has benefits. Uh, but there's evidence showing that each successive generation has a lower proportion of people who get, have primary care physicians. So the, the boomers had higher, I don't know, 60%, and then the X genders lower, and the millennials have a very low proportion who have a primary care physician at all. So there's generational effects too. And this is a whole, it's like an intersecting uh, workforce crisis that's happening. and that just in general, that the value of primary care, the value proposition may have been lost over the years. It needs to be reclaimed. So I've had the opportunity to practice medicine um, on the West Coast, um, the uh, East Coast, Mid-Atlantic, and then uh, New Jersey, Philadelphia area, and now back in my native Midwest. And I have to say that my experience on the West Coast, uh, just in terms of a shared ethos around the provision of primary care, regardless of the ability of patient's ability to pay, which is much greater on the West Coast and seen much more as a, um, a privilege uh, of right rather than a privilege. Um, when I practiced medicine for a short period of time on the East Coast, there seemed to be an argument around the quote unquote deserving poor and uh, the ability to navigate services and the provision of services for people who were in need uh, was certainly very lacking. And so I think that uh, it, it's very consistent with Dr. Prestabla's um, um, perspective on this. Uh, the issue of racial and ethnic concordance in terms of primary providers, I also think is, it may be to some extent in play here, in particular as it pertains to the receipt of preventive services um, for patients. And so I think that that makes a, a difference as well. Thank you. Um, so I think we are at time to transition to the expert panel. And thank you both for really wonderful presentations. And uh, Dr. Perez Dable, if you're able to stay on longer, that, fantastic. Um, uh, and, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hang out a little bit longer, yeah. Oh, great, okay. Very good. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, Again, Dr. Dorian Miller is going to participate in the panel, uh, and we are also joined by Dr. Mildred Cho, who is professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Medical Genetics, and, the Department, and in the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. Dr. Cho's major areas of interest are the ethical and social impacts of genetic research 
and data science in their applications, including uh, precision medicine, gene therapy, the human microbiome, and synthetic biology. And Isabel Duran, who is the founder of Latino Cancer Institute. Um, she is a pioneering award-winning Latina journalist, cancer survivor, and for the last 21 years, a leader in Latino Hispanic cancer education, advocacy, and research. She founded the Latino Cancer Institute as a nationwide network dedicated to developing and sharing best practices uh, and programs to enhance the work of uh, Latinx communities, services, agencies, and to provide collaboration with the global cancer research community. She's also a collaborator in SPHERE, um, and she has a, a, a long career in academia as well. So we'd like to welcome our three panelists and Dr. Peristable as well for the expert panel. We go to the next slide. Very good. So this is an opportunity if you could just go back, there we go, to uh, take into account the two presentations we've seen. And to the panel, I'd like, like to, the first discussion question is to discuss the major challenges to implementing precision health equity in your clinics and communities. And uh, for those who don't practice, just in general, your observations about clinical implementation uh, in, in diverse communities. So, uh, Thanks, uh, Dr. David. I'll, I can start with the first question because I'm a, a practicing primary care provider. Um, I, I've spent the last five years practicing in our uh, academic primary care group here at the University of Chicago, but prior to that um, was working in uh, community health centers, um, both in the uh, 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 public sector through uh, Cook County here in Chicago, as well as um, freestanding not-for-profit community health centers. And I think that a, a couple of issues come to, to mind when I think about the issue of uh, precision medicine and health equity. And it has to do with some of the um, uh, both insurance barriers and also access to care for my prior practice um, through uh, FQHCs um, in that getting patients in to be seen by a specialist um, and then um, not only getting them seen, having a diagnosis made, and then bridging the information gap around if there are, if there's genomic testing done for a particular diagnosis, what does that mean for me? What does it mean for my family if I, uh, if I need to have um, genetic testing done for um, my children, my grandchildren? Um, and how am I going to move forward with my life um, when I have perhaps a new diagnosis of a cancer made um, around this? And so the question for me were challenges around both accessing care in a setting where people could receive the information that they needed um, around precision medicine and also um, uh, the answering the question, what does this mean in the long term? Sean, I, Isabel yeah. here, I wasn't sure in which order you wanted to Oh, go. any order. Thank you, Isabel, Very please. Good. Yeah. So uh, uh, in some ways we'll parrot Dr. Miller and thank you and Dr. Perez Table for the wonderful uh, comments. Um, I'm looking at it, of course, as an advocate through uh, both at the clinic and through the community lens. And first there is awareness, then there is cost, then there is use of an access to advanced diagnostic tools. And then there is the matter of variance of uncertain significance. On the clinic side, too few clinics and clinicians have the essential tools or the training for genetic testing, understanding the findings to advise the patients and then access to the genetic counselors to help them understand. The clinics most often can't cover the cost of testing. Many insurance providers are not overly willing to pay for genetic testing. Often the clinics don't have easy access or a relationship with major cancer centers to refer the patient. And finally, and this may seem simple, but very low income and the undocumented don't have medical homes. And often they don't search out care until they're at advanced stage when the most sophisticated and advanced diagnostic tools are very costly and rarely available to them, talking about equity care. Um, and then just to meet the standard of care, whereas early intervention 
and a simple genetic test perhaps for uh, BRCA risk might save money and lives. So it really is at what stage people are actually getting access to precision care. Um, and I, I appreciated Dr. Perez kind of pointing out that all care should be precise and, 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 yeah. and it should have precision to it, even looking at social determinants of health. On the community side, too few community members at many income and education levels have enough awareness about genetics or genetic testing or family history and the importance of it to ask for uh, or demand testing. Um, depending on their level of income, again, the most vulnerable don't have the insurance or the money to pay for testing. Most often they can't uh, get access to appropriate genetic counselors who speak their language so they can make informed decisions once they're tested. And if they get past these three steps, many don't have direct access to quality comprehensive cancer centers who can provide and guide them, navigate them through the treatment in their own language if necessary. Uh, systems and researchers need to stop putting variants of unknown significance aside and work with a lab who is able and willing to take on this heavy lift to determine if there is a significance, particularly or relative to the racial or ethnic group by identifying new variants. And mind you, there are some 22 to 28 subpopulations of Latinos in the US and differentiation in admixture as uh, uh, Eliseo pointed out might actually mean different levels of risk. As I like to define them, some Latinos eat salsa, some dance salsa, and some of them who are at risk risk do both. In other words, we are different, not one size fits all. And to effectively target and eliminate cancer related health disparities, we need a better understanding of the molecular characteristics of the disease and the relationship with race and ethnicity needed, hence variants. In some research cases, despite the lower socioeconomic status, more limited access to care and diagnosis at advanced stages of disease that would predict uh, otherwise. Otherwise, mortality cases are still lower among Latinos than other non-Hispanic whites. Why is that? Is that that Latino paradox that we talk about? What can we learn from that? How can we apply it to across, across the span of patients? Clearly, we need a more comprehensive molecular characterization of cancers. And finally, sorry, I'm about to finish. To rectify all of this, there needs to be better genetic training and testing at the clinic level made affordable and accessible to lower socioeconomic patients. Big investments need to be made in community-based organizations who are willing and able to add, the, uh, add health components to their menu, who will hire and train and deploy community health workers to raise awareness, to diminish fear and mistrust, to work with clinics and other health systems to navigate the wary and worried patients. And we need to prep the system to serve the community and their patient before we can move to advanced precision medicine, diagnostics and intervention. And once we get there, the cost has to come way down. All of that is both equity leading to social justice. Thank you. It was so well said and, and it sounds like a, we need legislation and funding to take on all of these challenges. Um, thank you so much. And uh, Mildred, would you like to also comment on this discussion question? Oh yes, thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. And sorry, my internet is really bad. So I think I dropped out there for a minute, but um, I do, I wanna build on this, um, some of the points that, uh, that Isabel and, and Dr. Um, sort of really address this issue of how precision medicine is really a population-based exercise. So we're, what we're doing there is we're trying to stratify risks according to categories that we hope are relevant to the outcomes of interest like health disparities. So I think um, we, that risk stratification exercise can really very quickly become very stereotyping and profiling in ways that inhibit, you know, how we can apply that to address health disparities if we're not careful, if we don't do the categorization correctly, and or even if we are not even collecting the data. So I'll just give you some examples from this fantastic article that was published in Health Affairs, a blog um, that came out last week. Um, so first of all, you know, Asians and Hispanics, they said in this article, that are more likely to be classified as other in hospital discharge data. 
So that right there, you, then how are we gonna measure health disparities? We can't do that. Um, Asian Americans are not listed as a vulnerable population in a national academy's framework for equitable allocation of COVID vaccine. So there again, if you know, and so why are they not listed as vulnerable populations? Have been due to stereotyping, but some of it's also due to, um, you know, inaccurate collection of data or aggregation of data, as we were talking about one of the uh, questions raised before was about how there's all this heterogeneity and we lump it all together and then you obscure differences that are actually health disparities. So, you know, um, so for example, if you, um, uh, you may have um, heard that Filipino Americans are 4% of the nursing workforce, but we're over 30% of the COVID deaths. So, you know, the, these are the kinds of things that get obscured when you sort of lump Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asians, and then also maybe race isn't really the relevant factor. So you also have to consider whether the stratification that we're doing Thanks for letting me <laughs> kind of put that out there. But I think, you know, I think we, um, in terms of trying to turn this into, you know, how to change, how to, how to sort of fix this problem, I think our understanding of, you know, what categories are really relevant um, disparities and, um, and whether the categories that which in a lot of cases, I think they're not. Thank you. you you're cutting out there a little bit, but um, th I think your comments cover so many challenges in terms of just the metrics and the frameworks we're using and, and missing so much nuance. Um, there's a question from a participant. Um, how can we get payers, insurance companies to pay for genotyping tests so that our patients can have access to these services? a good question. Uh, would anyone like to take that on? I, this all say, I would say that first you have to show that it makes a difference before you get health insurance or the system to pay for it. Otherwise, it's research. Yeah, I think the BRCA example is a good one or, you know, uh, and or estimating risk in breast cancer, we have lots of data that you can actually makes a difference in what you would do to prevent uh, breast cancer in terms of screening or, or uh, you know, hormonal therapy. Um, so I, I think the, the onus is on us. Yeah. And uh, there, has, right, there has to be clinical utility demonstrated and that's hard to show without a lot of prospective trials. And the National Academy of Medicine put out a consensus report on the decision framework for payers for genetic tests. And it's based really on clinical utility demonstration. And um, for many of these tests, at least for BRCA1, BRCA2, and depending on the context and the risk, it, there's clinical utility, but for many um, that hasn't been demonstrated. So I think that's the science has to drive this, but CMS also needs to be up to date with, with respect to which tests have shown improved outcomes. Um, question from Dr. Stolberg at the University of Chicago. I appreciated Dr. Perez Lavalle's earlier point that not all innovation is helpful. And Ms. Duran's point that skilled genetic counseling is one of the big missings in del delivering good genomic healthcare. Can someone address the risk of profit motive to drive genetic testing ahead of our ability to do anything helpful, useful, appropriate with the findings? Well, I think Dr. David, that's what's driving it now. <laughs> it's all, it's mostly profit driven. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen some of the work we're doing, in fact, some of the work I'm doing with one of my Stanford partners now is that they are in, uh, in communities where clinics are actually embracing the issue of genetics. They are partnering with some uh, genetic uh, you know, sequencing companies and they are providing either low cost and sometimes free, but it's also possibly very limited what they're, what they're willing to test. 
And so um, to me, the bottom line is still the profit. They are doing a little bit of investment into that charity care everybody talks about. But I don't think they're seeing the long-term goal, which is in improving the health care, you're probably going to get more testing, which means you might actually end up making more money in the long run goes down exponentially over time, you're going to have more people being tested, uh, not for the wrong reasons, obviously. And so, but it's like nobody wants to, to visualize long-term address of I think your mute is on. Who works in equity health uh, in Minneapolis said, he's African-American said, you know, the system isn't broken. The system does what it was meant to do, and that's make money. What it doesn't do is provide equal quality care for everybody in this country. I think we heard Dr. Miller and Perez Tabli already define that. So it really is policy. It is intentional on the part of lawmakers and healthcare systems to move together in ways in which they put the heavy boot on the next, sorry, this is probably a very bad idea. Uh, they, they, they use their power to force provider, uh, uh, policy, uh, excuse me, insurance companies to do indeed provide testing for everyone for whom it is prescribed and, and, and requested. And the government can help force the policy and the paying and utilize that, that big stick in order to make these um, people move forward. They did it with Obamacare to some extent. You know, why can't, but unfortunately half the states or large numbers of states haven't even adopted Obamacare. So poor people are going unable to even access, you know, a mid-level of care. So I think it really behooves leadership on multiple levels to really come down hard on uh, insurance companies to really make changes. So what does that lead us to? Medicare for all? Oh, sorry, I don't mean to. <laughs> it's just, I think that advocates have been tired of this conversation for a long time now. Thank you. Um, and we have a comment, bravo Isabel from Maria Juarez Reyes. All right, so let's uh, move on to the second question. So, and this is uh, to, if the panelists can discuss ways the research community can better build trust and engagement with diverse communities. I know everyone here has been involved with community engagement, but this issue of trust building, if you wouldn't mind addressing this, and, and this goes out to all panelists, any who would like to take it first, including uh, Lisa, if you'd like to um, join the panel. So much of the work that I do through our Institute for Translational Medicine is in the area of community engagement. And um, I, I, I'm going to shorthand this by saying that community engagement is retail, not wholesale. And you may say, what does that mean? It means establishing relationships with people and asking them what is important to them and then figuring out if there are ways in which you can provide communities with the things that they are asking for. And it may have less to do with research and more to do with perhaps jobs for the youth in their communities. It may have to do with uh, equitable sharing of data and resources as resources come in to the researchers and you're asking community members to participate to say, how are we going to develop an equitable sharing relationship in terms of my community participating in your study? And then are you going to leave us at least better off than when you came? And so some of you are on the call are probably familiar with the term helicopter researcher in terms of somebody coming in swooping, doing the research, leaving, and the community is asking, well, they came and took this information and what happened and what's been left for us and how can I act upon this information if I don't have access to it? And so there are different ways in which one can figure out how to do a better job in partnering with community, but making sure that it really goes back to that patient slash community centered approach that I mentioned early on in my comments. And that is addressing people according to their needs, 
values and preferences, and then figuring out equitable ways in which one can share resources and information. Um, and, and, and part of that trust is developed through transparency yeah. um, and being uh, very transparent about what uh, researchers can provide, what they cannot provide um, in, in terms of doing community-engaged research. And what, and what I hear, uh, Dr. Miller, in your first description is that important word, empathy. You, you bring that, that communication skill with you that shows um, caring and concern, uh, and it's not just about a paper. Uh, COVID, I think, has taught us a harsh but very clear lesson because I witnessed and I read and I heard about health systems who finally, some of us would say out of desperation, subcontracted with community-based organizations to help with getting people to testing, to tracking and to educating impacted communities about the masking and the distancing and the other health prevention messages. And now they're using them to register these vulnerable populations for vaccination. So COVID is teaching us that diverse and particularly long disaffected communities can be reached through community-based organizations and influencers. Um, even pharma learned that lesson when recruiting for COVID clinical trials. What did they do? They went back to their site investigators who went back to the community-based organizations who then turned back to the community and brought them forward and bridged that mistrust, uh, created that, that trustworthiness. Um, you know, CBOs must be seen. They must be treated not as helpmates, but as equal partners. And the language of science must be as clear as the language of the street and communities and their leaders not be made to feel inadequate. The portioning of dollars, you ask the question, I have an answer. The portioning of dollars that researchers could be, uh, sorry, should be equivalent to the effort, not just a simple honorarium and a uh, you know, the relationship uh, is now required by grantors. So these partners must become essential. And finally, uh, Mildred, before I be quiet, I think it's really important for research to understand how creating that initial relationship, investing, creating that partnership can help the agency grow, become better, understand research, become a really great partner um, and really want to do it again to have that relationship, um, Mildred, because I've spoken with you about these things before and we recognize how important that bridge is between community and research. Thank you. Yes. Mildred, Sorry please. about that. I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt. My internet is just so terrible, it uh, <laughs> dropped out. So um, yeah, I just wanted to second that and also what Dr. Miller said and, and, and just relay a specific uh, example of how to do this that I read in an article by uh, Maya Sabatello and Paul Applebaum at Columbia. And they pointed out how, um, you know, researchers are asking uh, different communities to, to get engaged in research by participating, giving their blood, giving their samples and everything, but don't actually participate themselves. So a very simple thing would be mm. for researchers to say, roll up, I'm rolling up my sleeve and I'm gonna give, give to this effort as well. You know, I think that following the principles um, that have been promoted through the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute are applicable to community entities as well. And that is become engaged in the planning, the implementation and the dissemination of research. Um, so that in addition to the, the principles that I talked a little bit about ago, you know, the issue of transparency, um, equal relationships, reciprocity, et cetera, that if there is engagement at that level, um, that will build uh, trust because everybody has some skin in the game to, to Dr. Cho's point a moment ago um, in terms of being able to give. So a really important point. Thank you so much. We, I think we have time for the final discussion question, which is what are the research and dissemination topics we should prioritize going forward to advance precision health equity? Well, I think that, uh, you know, um, this may have been mentioned before, but I think that there's um, still a need even before sort of thinking about research topics that we still need to fix the data problem. And so, you know, even a really good research question is just going to come up with the wrong answer or not going to be 
useful if we don't fix the problem of lack of diversity um, in the underlying data. And, and to that point, uh, Mildred, I think that adding to the data collected social determinants of health, which really, and, and I understand that is a conversation these days, but to, I think, to the healthcare systems, that seems like a big lift. But I think it's for most vulnerable populations, it's possibly some of the most important data about what drives risks and their, and their illnesses, uh, because then you can make a more precise <laughs> diagnosis of why, in fact, they might be uh, turning up uh, ill all the time uh, and seeming out of compliance. But it's not the drug itself that will heal all. It is other issues around that, uh, in fact, drive those adverse events. So um, I think that that's really crucial to, to have a, some kind of a requirement that all systems must include social determinants of health in, in, uh, in healthcare records as well as in research. Couldn't I agree think, more. Yeah, I, I agree. The intersectionality, I think, is extremely important. I, um, I'm just thinking about the data collection that's taking place through the All of Us program, which is not just about looking at genomes, but it's also looking at where do you live? What is your education level? Where, where do you work? Who is in your environment? Um, all of those things that make up what we consider to be part of a health framework, um, really much more of an ecological system around health, um, I think is uh, uh, one of the ways in which we can help to at least start to set priorities around the intersectionality that will help to impact um, um, health equity and, and therefore lead to more precision health. And one last thing, uh, Dr. David, I think it would be really cool on the part of researchers to actually identify some of the local community-based organizations and the work that they are doing, and then go to them and say, is there something you want us to measure? Is there something you want us to help prove it's successful or not? And what are the reasons why it's not successful? Start there. Don't come to yeah. take, come to give. And I think that it might help an organization who's really doing a really fabulous program that they, um, that they created show that it is really successful and can be shown as a best practice. And now it's been proven uh, uh, you know, a quality product or program because it's been measured in a scientific evidence-based way. Um, too often we, we flip and we say, we want to go prove this idea we have. Well, there are a lot of things happening in communities already that are great ideas in which they're really driving shifts, changes inside their own communities because they can't wait for people to come and discover them or the money to be given to them. Yeah. So I think if you shift, um, you know, if you shift how you look at research and try that, you might start building that bridge and that trustworthiness that uh, Dr. Miller mentioned. Absolutely. And Dr. Miller is leading a number of efforts that are doing that, not only citizen scientists, oh. but also um, advisory boards, and in some ways, hopefully a, a community-based research network that has uh, local champions contributing to the, the scientific questions. There is one other thing as well. I think in terms of the metrics for social determinants, that there's major needs for uh, change, innovation, implementation, all the, we need to get the genetics right in the sense that top med is now doing trans-ethnic sequencing analyses that hopefully will give us ubiquitous um, genotypes and polygenic risk scores that can be applied to all populations. So hopefully the days where we simply look at 20% admixture thresholds and, and eliminate people from analyses because they don't fit into a category Hopefully we can move away from that and get to a more trans-ethnic approach to the molecular genetics. Um, so we have, uh, we're coming up to the end here. And if there are any, any other comments from the panel uh, before we wrap up. Uh, I just want to- Yes. Go ahead, I think that's Eliseo, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I just want to make sure that the precision and communication not be forgotten here. So precision mm -hmm. medicine is not just genetics. It's also how you communicate with patients. Uh, and I think this is an area that needs to be studied a lot more. Uh, and, and in the context of uh, 
genomics, it has been a lot of work with, uh, you know, the LC program. Uh, and also, I think the return of results uh, on ethical issues. And so I think there are multiple opportunities to, to apply this. So. Thank you all so much. I'd like to take this opportunity to once again, thank you, Dr. Alceo Peristavo, Dr. Dorian Miller, Isabel Duran, uh, Dr. Mildred Cho, uh, my co-host, uh, uh, Dr. Lisa um, uh, Goldman Roses, and also um, Jill Evans and, and Glenda Estioko for their, their technical assistance during this presentation. If we could go to the next uh, slide. Very good. So this is the first in the series. The next one is June 10th on germline screening and cancer for cancer and cardiovascular disease in minority populations. And then we'll have on the 17th, pharmacogenomics in underserved communities. Dr. Manoli Pereira is gonna be presenting that one. And then the final one will be on June 24th, polygenic risk scores and primary care screening. Uh, we have uh, the same registration link for each of those conferences. And uh, this will be made available as a video for those who have missed the seminar today. And make sure that you register for the CME credit as well. Any other comments, uh, Lisa? Um, no, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just uh, really looking forward to the June 10th uh, seminar, our next one coming up. So we have several speakers. We'll be talking about um, specific cases in cancer and cardiovascular disease. Uh, we also have a primary care provider who's been implementing this in federally qualified health centers, as well as patient advocate, a patient advocate. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next seminar and agree that this was uh, a wonderful panel and um, extend yeah. my gratitude to them as well as to our attendees for their great questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and. You. Uh, Participants will re receive an email with a link to an evaluation. So thank you all very much today. And we look forward to, doc to uh, Dr. Lisa Goldman Roses uh, leading the next seminar on June 10th. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks.